Ah, the hands of time. Don't they just keep ticking away, regardless of what we do, paying no attention to us whatsoever? Well, my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. I remember its face so vividly. It's been branded upon my mind, and the memory thereof brings back the sting and ache of my affliction. I must recall it all here. My account does not withstand logical interrogation, but do not think that I am mad or seeking attention. You will not know me here, but you will know my story. I use my remaining faculties to compose and expose my strange experience, so you too may be aware of the hidden and uncanny forces which prey upon our livelihood and our souls. Now I will recount my dreadful ordeal, starting from the beginning of that silent summer. After dropping my twin and my parents off at the airport and saying goodbye, I drove back home, taking the familiar and confusing back roads. From the quiet drive back, I appreciated the, <laughs> the vulnerability. I was to live alone in a big house in a heavily wooded area for a week. Still, there was nothing to suggest a need for concern. I had my terrier, Fred, by my side. Also, the house had an alarm system, and I knew where the firearm was. I was king of the castle, and the associated tasks were a small price to pay for this temporary independence. Nothing was going to happen, and I was to make sure of it. When I first closed the door behind me, I henceforth perceived a continual strangeness to this new isolation. Despite familiarity, I was never quite accustomed to silence in such a spacious dwelling. It was so quiet and I was kept company by the clickety-clack of Fred's claws, the light tick-tock of the foyer clock, and the seldom distant memory of the hours. <clears throat> the house was old, about a century or so. The woodwork would creak loudly underfoot in some spots, but sometimes it would creak subtly on its own. The house had been at odds with gravity for years, and it was slowly settling. Well, regardless of the haunting loneliness, I eagerly awaited my overindulgence of the senses. Food, games, and television awaited me. I should have known better, but many of my expeditions into the glowing window were of gothic fiction. The totals were not overly intense, but they were enough to safely sate my need for adrenaline with the side effect of unsettling my soul on most nights. Despite my difficulty sleeping, Born of illogical fear and the house's abyssal silence, I was optimistic knowing that this week of summer was all mine. Still, as the first few uneventful days passed, the idleness of summertime freedom proved yet again more bittersweet than anticipated. I could have continued writing an unfinished novel, practiced my guitar, or honed my other artistry, so I may fulfill the dreams dreamt in my days of youth or long hours of work. The lonely week was my own, and I could have used it. Ironically, what I desired at the time, each time, each day, was nothing but slothful recreation. None of my forlorn past loves were even touched. Uh, they collected dust in the dilapidated, desolate corners of my room and my mind. The third night I elected to view something different on the downstairs family room television. Recently that big old box had been giving everyone trouble. For about ten seconds after activating the power, the screen would be emblazoned by multicoloured flickering lines until the picture became clear. Tonight I did this for about a minute before showing a good picture. Obviously the piece of junk was deteriorating and due for replacement, but that was not what troubled me. For a split second during that start-up period, I could have sworn I saw the rough outline of a hand somewhere in that seizure of a display. After blinking before firmly focusing on the screen, I saw no recurrence of what I'd probably imagined. I felt chill at the thought, feeling even more so once I turned my head and saw the tall floor lamp's hanging power chain swaying suspiciously more than normal. Already leery, I stood up and backed away from the couch, 
with the floor creaking and cracking loudly as I slowly stepped away, intently looking at the corner. I looked behind me. Nothing there. I looked in front of myself again and decided to see if there was a draft causing the movement. Indeed, in the corner of the floor there was an air vent, breathing out cool air, but not hard enough to cause the chain to swing so much. It usually swings when someone walks in or when the windows open, but it was swinging even more than normal. It looked as if someone had started it on purpose. Ah, perhaps I bumped into it on accident, I told myself, since there was no other rational explanation. There was no possibility anyone else could have done that, and there was no reason for me or the house to suddenly be experiencing such anomalies. The house had been relatively peaceful, and I had taken care of it alone before without incident. <laughs> I'm just overthinking things, I said as I stopped the chain still. The whole time Fred just stared at me like I was playing a game. On the fifth day, Wednesday, all was still well. There was no sign of anything abnormal since that incident a few days prior, and I continued my daily routine. The task I'd been charged with included watering the flowers in the morning, checking the mailbox, caring for the dog, and turning the alarm off and on in the morning and evening, respectively. Another chore I was given included being on the lookout for the occasional delivery. Father was an antiquarian of sorts. He would often buy and sell goods at the local flea market. His collection in the basement included paintings, clocks, statues, and various other antiques. During the week... I received a total of three packages and moved them to the basement as directed. Before leaving, Father had noted that one delivery was particularly large and would need to be taken directly to the basement through the backyard. The house was built on an incline, so the basement could be entered through one ground-level door. The third package arrived on Wednesday. The delivery man noted its weight and that it needed to be carried upright, so I helped to carry it around back into the basement. While we moved the thing, he commented on how it had scared him at three o'clock when it harshly chimed. Apparently we were carrying another clock. After carefully resting it against the wall in the basement, I signed for it and bid the man farewell. Unlike the earlier two deliveries which I had left in their boxes, I felt compelled to open this one chiefly because it seemed oddly unstable in its packaging. The bottom of the box had a slight convexity to it, probably due to the copious tape applied by the vendor. After opening it, I carefully removed all of the packing and cardboard before ensuring the antique was stable on its wooden base. It was a beautifully carved wooden grandfather clock with a golden and silver face. Packing was present inside its glass front, holding the pendulums and weight securely still. It was currently disassembled. The time was not accurate, around one twenty-five or so, therefore the man's account of its bell chiming at three o'clock was rather curious. The only explanation, aside from dishonesty, was that this was likely a fake antique with a separate component still functioning inside. Even so, that would be strange, since it appeared old and worn. I carefully opened the glass front and inspected for any insecure parts that may fall. Inside was a paper detailing typed instruction on assembly. Well, I decided to leave this task for its buyer. Carefully placed the parts and instructions in a vacant spot on the neighbouring mahogany dresser, which was covered in other antique clocks. These smaller clocks unsettled the atmosphere with their uncoordinated faint ticking, although they were never noisy enough to be heard from the first floor. I looked outside the basement window once more upon the orange sunset before locking the door and heading back upstairs, making dinner and then retreating to my room. At about ten that night, I settled down on the couch in the living room and turned on the television. While it started up, I remembered my family would finally return in two days. Fred jumped up onto my lap, and we watched whatever I felt like for over an hour. Before falling asleep, though, I began to develop a headache. My left temple was pounding, and both my eyes would see occasional floaters flashing in multiple colours. 
The inside of my mouth and my left cheek started to feel numb. I walked to the kitchen and took an aspirin with water before returning to the couch. Ah, my blinking would only intermittently cause the floaters to subside, but the longer I kept my eyes shut, the more the symptoms improved. I suppose that this was sleep deprivation, or a migraine, or both. Too tired to get up, I rested on the couch with Fred on my lap until I fell asleep. I woke up at midnight but not by my mind's own volition. The silence was suddenly broken by a hellishly harsh tone coming straight from beneath the seat. And then again, and again, and again. The clock was chiming, despite its disassembly. Each chime felt like a fist beating on my skull. My aching mind was full of fog, so at the time I thought I was correct that there was an active independent component still inside the clock. Why had I not heard it until now? I checked my watch, which showed midnight exactly. But the hands of the grandfather clock did not move during my entire time in the basement, and they would not have corresponded with such timing. What was happening? My right arm was numb from the weight of Fred, who also woke from his slumber. I started to move, but then I noticed the lamp chain swinging again. Interestingly, Unlike before, Fred began intently gazing into the corner of the room. He was silent, stiff, and, most shockingly, he was cold. I looked at the corner as well. His head turned towards me as I did this, and then he returned his gaze to the area of interest and growled. A sound I'd seldom heard. His growl was usually directed at silly things like guests at the front door or strangers walking outside. But a growl at something unseen? His eyesight was not the best, and I'm sure he could not have noticed that small detail of the lamp chain swinging so gently in the dark corner. Perhaps he sensed me and my delusional fear. It didn't matter what was on our minds. What did matter was what was causing the chain to swing, which I hoped was the floor vent. I watched for what felt like the longest time. The family room clock displayed three after midnight. Even the sight of the dead television was harrowing since I distinctly didn't remember turning it off. Considering the many inexplicable sights and sounds, my paranoia quickly boiled into a seething panic. Time creeped along slowly. It was five after twelve. I looked in the corner. The lamp's chain was swinging gently, perpetually, like a pendulum. Fred had still not moved. I gently pushed his right leg with my thumb, but it did not give way like normal. He was frozen, and I became so as well. I wanted to move, to escape from that position, to just get something, to arm myself. I wanted to set the alarm, go to my room and lock the door with Fred and a weapon by my side. I would have rather been anywhere else. Why did I stay behind? Why did I forsake the company for my desolate haunt of solitude? My mind was frantic with fright from something that was likely not even there. These thoughts are foolish, I thought to myself, and I decided to act. I began moving so slightly out of my seat when I noticed a sudden thud, loud and close. I froze again at war with myself in my head. There was no way something could be in the dark corner at that time since it was impossible and too congruent with my suspicion. On the other hand, my God-given senses of natural instinct had triggered positive, confirming something was indeed there despite all the odds. This conundrum instantly shot through my head in a second, and I did not sit still any longer. I sprang from the seat, sending Fred leaping from my lap to the floor. He continued to stare and growl at the corner. The fur between his shoulder blades was raised high and splayed wildly. His eyes were open wider than I'd ever seen before. He was trying to pierce the darkness to perceive what could possibly be there. 
It's amazing how vivid the details become when the heart works against chilled blood. These facts I noticed and comprehended within the two seconds it took me to stand, ready to bolt at the very next sensation entering my aching brain. Something was there. I noticed the chain swung more than it had earlier. Now, with more conviction, I believe there was something in that corner. But what was it? How big was it? What was its reason for being there? I could clearly see, at least above the couch's height, and it was not likely a person. The window above my seat was shut tight. Also, no one would have behaved in such a way. Even if someone had broken in, silently creeping to the corner would have been quite a difficult task, considering my presence and the many creaking spots in the floor. Perhaps it was a creature. It certainly would not have been able to open the locked doors. Perhaps a rat had clawed in through the floor vent. Yes, that had to be it. I could not deduce anything more likely. How foolish I was to think it was an intruder. Oh, these silent days were getting to me, and cabin fever must have set in and altered my thinking. I tried to calm myself down, and I took a step forward. And the wooden floor squeaked loudly. This was immediately followed by a clatter from the corner, like scuffling and scratching sounds of something much larger than a rat. I picked Fred up and rushed for the stairs. He yelped and turned to bite me, but I carried him nonetheless. Rather than hearing the noise approaching directly behind me as I fled out of the room, I noticed it was shifting towards the couch. No human could do that. It was a creature. It was running behind the seat. The window blinds there shook as it moved past, and I heard it scuffle out and up onto the carpeted step of the sitting room adjacent to the couch. Fred barked wildly, and I'm sure I would have too if I were him. Whatever that thing was had some heft. I would estimate it was the size of a medium-sized dog from the dense sounds of its alarmingly rapid and rhythmic steps. The couch had only up to a half foot of space behind it. So how big was it, truly? I wondered if it was a raccoon, but the loud fluttering noise of its movement was very weird, almost like a continuous crackling. Because of what followed... I could not deduce this situation to be something so mundane. I really wanted it to be, but I could not overcome the dreaded atmosphere. Through the continuous, high-pitched ringing in my ears, at that time I heard clatter bellowing from the basement below, like items being violently thrown, or as if fully stocked shelves were collapsing. The sounds were that of breaking wood and shattering glass. Yet this was separate from the scurrying noise from which we sought escape. It was as if hell had opened up, and I was fleeing even the sight of its growing field of manifestation. I knew not whether that thing was chasing me, but I would not take the chance. I decided to go upwards to the safety of my bedroom. In retrospect, it could have been wiser to flee the dwelling entirely into the blackness of night, although I was unaware of the speed of my pursuer. I could also have run to obtain the gun, but it was on the other side of the house and locked in a safe. Reaching it would have been slow, rendering me cornered and exposed. But I knew I could blockade myself in my own room, and the keys to my vehicle were there. I cannot say the details of my decision were weighed so carefully during my frightful run, but regardless, I ran for my room. I dared not use the foyer stairway, since the sitting room led directly there. I ran past that, through the kitchen, and used the back stairs. All in the meantime I heard the approach of that creature in the sitting room, but I ran too fast to see it emerge into clear sight. By the time I reached the back stairs, it could have been in the foyer for all I knew. Then came the race to the finish line for my room was equidistant to the foyer and back stairways, and the long upstairs hallway connected both ends. So, with Fred in my arms, I sprinted as hard as possible. To my relief, nothing was in sight, 
though I could hear a frantic flurry of scratches on the wooden floor of the foyer. My shoulder slammed into the door from my attempt at perpendicular change in direction. I slammed the door behind me, threw Fred to his bed on the floor and locked the door, and then scrambled to find my pocket knife. I couldn't find it. My room was a blasted disaster, a result of months of rueful neglect. I ran for the nightstand in the attempt to further blockade the door with something heavy, but its weight, triple what I'd anticipated due to its contents, halted my progress. I heard it in the hallway. The damn thing was chasing me. Without thinking, I madly threw whatever I could toward the door. Then I realized a use for my unwashed linens. I dumped the entirety of my laundry hamper at the door and packed all of those clothes at the door crack with great speed. Fred kept barking wildly at the intruder while I kept trying to shush him so I could listen for it. I heard it scuff to the carpet right in front of my room. Then I heard it stop. By holding his muzzle, I shut Fred up for a few moments. I heard nothing but the ringing in my ears for five seconds, and then the scratches at the door began. I momentarily convulsed from sheer terror of realising that this thing was still trying to get me. Fred barked incessantly, yet I did not care. I could hardly hear at the height of my panic with the pounding of my heart resonating to my eardrums, muffling the world around me. My outer vision was blackening, my strength faltering, but I did not succumb to my senses, as my brain kicked me to action when I viewed the stupefying sight of the laundry starting to move on its own. Was it possible this thing could fit underneath such a small space? I sprang to the bed and stripped it bare, hurling the sheets and covers onto the heap in vain attempt to further pack the pile. But I still saw movement. In a flash, I grabbed my room's small television, tearing it from the roll, and slammed it on top of the pile to hold it still, straining my right shoulder and neck in the process. I couldn't figure how to proceed. I was trapped. There was no way out except the window, and I was on the second floor. I could survive the fall, but not without injury. Maybe I could roll as I hit the ground. I considered it, although I'd never tried it before. I drew up the window blinds and looked to the ground below. Even injuring myself, I could climb to my vehicle and drive away if I brought my keys from the room with me. But then I realized I could not bring Fred. His small body would not withstand the fall. The rapping at the door continued. I could hear it digging like a knife into the wood of the door. My thoughts grew more desperate as seconds ticked by. Then I had an idea. The mattress. I could toss it out of the window, hold Fred in my arms, and jump with him outside to the cushion below. Preparing to enact my mad plan, I snatched the keys and went to the window. Its handle did not budge as I cranked it, and the brittle thing broke under the stress. I tried the other window, but the handle was blocked by a poorly placed desk, far too heavy to move. I tried the first window again, and the stump of its broken crank could not be turned by hand. My attempts to do so caused me to cut my fingers. The deep, harsh scratching and crunching at the door continued to grow in intensity, and I became horrified at the thought that the thing could somehow be digging through. My instinct pushed me to drastic measures. The cold sweat and gnawing stomach ate and electric jolt in my back drove me to act without thinking. I grabbed my old dusty guitar from the corner of my room and bashed the window open. The cool night air beckoned for me as I seized my mattress and clumsily cast it to the ground below. Before my big move, I made sure I had the keys and my wallet. Next, I put on some spare shoes in my closet so the window glass would not hurt me. Then... What I was to do was to simply grab Fred so he may leap to safety. And then the sound stopped. 
I turned aghast to the silent door and saw that a new vertical crack had emerged from behind the pile of clothes. I stared for seconds in silence, only interrupted by Fred's occasional barks. Then the clothes started to move again. As my unthinking body shook, I saw something emerge. Its movement was a blur, but I could make out some details. Its overall colour was that of rust or dry blood. It had a central, irregularly rugate body, with no visible face or eyes, and it had many appendages, of which I thought I saw five in total. Its size was unexpectedly large, as the span of all its spindly limbs was nearly the size of an adult human torso. In an instant the thing lunged from its position and grabbed hold of me. In a whirlwind of screaming shock and terror, I tried yanking it off of my leg, but somehow it latched onto my hand. It was biting me with what felt like a hundred needles. In bewildered agony, I beheld my enemy. Its limbs were regularly segmented and jointed like that of a crab, and they were hard and pointed, with a blade-like sharpness to the underside. Most nauseating and vile was its body's underside, revealing tens or even a hundred small, jointed limbs reaching to scoop its prey towards its underbelly's centre. I heard the crunching and crackling of its chitinous joints, and the cracking sound of its own limbs against itself. The five blade-like legs were cutting deep into my arm, just past the wrist. It was as if the very hand of Satan was gripping mine with the full intent of yanking it off. Oh, my terror was exacerbated by the permanent implication. It is not common for anybody to imagine what it is like to live evermore without a dominant hand. In my frenzied struggle against the creature, I slammed it against the window opening sharp glass. I picked up a pen and jabbed it into the body of this thing repeatedly. With a mixed feeling of fright and relief, I saw the thing splay its limbs outward and release me. Without thinking, I used my other hand to knock it out the window. Oh, curse the thought that its fault was cushioned by my mattress. I immediately turned my attention to my bitten hand, or what was left of it. It was intact, but hanging to the rest of me by chip bone and crimson threads. I was losing blood fast. I took my shirt and shaped it into a makeshift sling by holding it in part with my teeth. With my good arm, I put the other one into the sling. I took another shirt and wrapped it around the wound as much as I could with one hand to prevent the loss of blood. It took some careful, yet quick and excruciating work. I looked out and could no longer see the creature, which must have scurried off. I have no idea where it went, but I was not going to find out. I had to flee, but I was worried the thing could come back and kill Fred. I wanted to take him with me, but there was little I could do with just one hand. Kicking my guitar out of the way, I opened the closet door, led him to it, and closed the door after turning on its light. I sealed the bottom crack shut with linings like before, as quickly as possible. I took a piece of paper and wrote with my functioning hand, Fred in closet. I weighed it down in plain sight so it would not go unnoticed. I struggled to escape through my shoddy blockade. I fled down the hall, back down the stairs, and to my father's room. I knew where the safe was, hidden in a corner of the room behind many things, and I prepared to obtain my defence. But oh, the unfeasibility of wielding a gun I'd never shot with my non-dominant hand slowly manifested in my mind as my pain and lacking dexterity became more and more apparent. Gritting my shirt in my teeth, I reluctantly left for a lesser weapon, a large kitchen knife. The fastest way to the vehicle was the front door, yet that was precisely where the creature had fell. I had no idea exactly where that otherworldly hell spawn was, and it very well could have been underneath my means of escape. Angrily biting the cotton in my mouth, I resolved to not take even this chance. I flew in the opposite direction to the backyard exit, and I ran around to the street, taking care to look around for any threat. 
Clearing the house without being caught was fortunate. I carefully slid the knife handle in my pocket to conceal it and, and prevent incorrect perceptions of my intent. My jaw muscles spasmed from the continual strain, worsening the painful pounding in my temples. I ran in the dark, looking over my shoulder constantly. The humid night fog obscured the road from my dilated eyes. I had to hurry before my troubled heart would succumb to the ongoing loss of red. I cannot place a value to the number of endless minutes I ran on that path, not meant for footsteps. Gradually, the ringing in my ears quieted, and the headache stopped. I felt so tired. My muscles were starting to relax a little too much, and I had to support my broken hand with my other arm as my jaw went slack and I gasped for air. My heartbeats felt irregular, and the world began to spin around me. I was delirious by the time I finally encountered a driver passing me in the night. The ensuing events blurred as I was spirited to the nearest hospital. Some vital arteries and nerves were spared, making partial reattachment more likely than if it had been cut clean off. They still had to salvage some nerves, vessels and skin from other parts of the body to ensure even some functionality, but it will never be the same. I realise, as I type this document one-handed, that I am forced to say farewell to my musicianship and artistry. The most I can make of my disaster is to share my discovery that life is indeed too short and fragile to squander aimlessly. Still, I did not know exactly how or why this happened. Was I cursed for contact with that infernal clock? Was it a cruelly divine judgment for past transgressions unatoned? Or was the creature some demonic stowaway, hiding within an antique? No research would sate my desire for answers, and the baffling impossibility of that thing's surreptitious arrival and departure still burns my soul. Aside from the crises of my struggling health and newfound handicap, life resumed healthfully for others. The note was found, and Fred was safely rescued from my closet. Everyone I knew still wondered exactly what had transpired. The story too fantastical to share with those outside the family, was that I was attacked by a wild beast. But my folks were to know of the tale in its trueness. My family does believe me, as the aftermath of evidence was too apparent for even sceptics to deny. My door was chopped open at the bottom in a size large enough for that monstrosity to squeeze through. A black trail of staining ichor manifested on the thing's path of pursuit, tracing from my room all the way down the stairs, through the foyer and sitting room, behind the couch, and finally to the air vent underneath the lamp chain. No further evidence of that black slime was ever found elsewhere, not even in the basement or the front yard. The family has changed their behaviour around the house, for they have cautiously searched, but have found no other sign of the beast. I can sometimes see Mother looking out the window at night. More often than before, I have seen my twin praying with hands clasped. Father has spent sleepless nights working out the slow and expensive process of our relocation. The basement's contents were eventually removed, but nobody descends to it any more without good reason. I was the first of my family to venture into the bottom level after the incident, but I will never again for it was during that descent when I beheld a ghastly sight in the area underneath the family room. The insidious truth began chilling my blood, and my arm worsened its ache. The clatter I'd heard during my flight from the faceless creature was the travesty I saw before me. All manner of antiques collected by my father over the years were strewn about the basement, and the collection of clocks were toppled, broken, and no longer keeping time. And the grandfather clock, supposedly disassembled before, was the most horrific item among the mess. All clocks were out of place, save for that infernal thing, defiantly upright. Whatever force had ensued that midnight had seeked the devil's hand upon me, 
It had sent so many valuable antiques crashing against the floor. It had also affected this machine in a most impressive and horrible way. I found that repulsive, vile monolith, fully assembled with both hands resting on the number twelve. admit it, you weren't quite sure anything was really going on, were you? It's just all in his imagination, until that point when it wasn't. Oh dear, oh dear. Creatures in the closet, never to be uh, frowned upon. Yeah, you got to take those things seriously. Have a good investigate, in case there's something really is there. <laughs> well, another fantastic story for you. Hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, well, I'm in a very, very good mood. My family is finally reunited here in the Netherlands, and... It's all system to go for me from now on. <sighs> Life's good. Well, my dear friends, sleep well, sweet dreams. I'll be back again with you very soon, but until then, bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so... Come check me out, okay?